So the title of my message today is Who do you trust? And I'll, I'll need some help, some volunteers, and I'm going to ask you that in a bit. Because I want to give you some practical examples uh, about what we're going to learn today. So the question is, who do you trust? And trust is a very important thing. And the dictionary says that trust is the firm belief in the reliability, truth, ability, or strength of some, someone or something. So this is what trust is. Trust is a firm belief in the reliability, uh, in the strength of someone or of something. So we trust in many different things. Also, if we're going to have a relationship with someone, we need to base those relationships in trust. So if we don't trust someone, we cannot sustain a relationship. Now, as Christians, we are called to trust God, but we are also called to trust one another. If we cannot trust one another, you know, there's a, a, a lack, there's a breach of trust. And whenever you have a breach of trust, you cannot sustain healthy relationships. I like to read the verse of scripture that is in Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're not going to read the whole chapter, but we're going to try to break this into two sections. And I, I would like to, uh, to have your attention because so many times Christians are under a curse. I'm going to say it again. Christians many times are under a curse. What's a curse? A curse is the opposite of the blessing. So when you're blessed, you know you're blessed, right? Come on, you know you're blessed. How many of you are blessed? I'm not going to ask how many of you are cursed. Because many times Christians are in denial. They don't want to admit that they are under a season which is not God's blessing. It's a season of curse. And God is a God of blessing, but God also sends curses. And He sent curses upon His own children, upon His people. And those curses were always a consequence of something, an act of disobedience. Now, as Christians, and most of you here, you're, you're already Christians, if you're not a Christian, we'll give you the opportunity today to give your life to God and to ask God for the forgiveness of your sins. But as Christians, sometimes we may fall a little bit to the side of God's grace. And things are not going exactly the way we think. And many Christians are even under uh, ignorance uh, 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 and asking God, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through these trials, these uh, moments? Uh, I don't know God. What's happening to me? So that's why you came to church today. Because God wants you to know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 17, God said through the prophet, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an inhabited salt land. So here's God saying, Cursed is the man, cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now we're going to uh, try to understand what, what the Lord is trying to say because it, the Lord is not saying don't trust in other people. You know there's people that they don't trust anyone and they'll say oh I don't trust anyone. This is not what God is saying and we're going to, to uh, uh, learn about it in a bit. But let's see the following verse. The following verse now says blessed is, is the man who trusts in the Lord whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Which one do you want to be? The first one or the second one? Do you want to be cursed or do you want to be blessed? 
I'm not talking about being saved. Being saved happens when you give your life to God. When you accept the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you're saved. Just this week, uh, myself, Pastor Jordan, went to uh, visit someone at the hospital and uh, I, I wasn't there when Pastor Jordan visited this man. I went there the next day. Uh, but he is um, uh, from uh, the reserve in Ganawaki and uh, he's been in, in the hospital for uh, quite a season without knowing what, what's happened to him. And I don't know what conversation he had with Pastor Jordan, but he was really blessed. He said he really enjoyed uh, the visit. But he told me something right then when I, when I introduced myself. He said, I accepted Jesus when I went to Sunday school. I was a little kid. But since then, I still have God in my heart. But I drink a lot. And I do stuff that I shouldn't be doing. I have all sorts of kinds of addictions. But I have Jesus in my heart. And some Christians have a hard time understanding this. That you can accept the Lord, but live out of God's grace, and you don't lose your salvation. Some people think, well, if you commit a sin, you lose your salvation. What kind of God have you? We're celebrating Father's Day. You know, I have kids. Sometimes they might do something that I don't like. They're still my children. I'm not rejecting them as children if they do wrong things. What kind of God do you have if you think that you're going to lose your salvation because you did something wrong? Listen, God's grace is sufficient to forgive you of all your sins. And when you give your life to Jesus, you become born again. God adopts you in the family. And if you were sincere and honest when you gave your heart to the Lord, you got saved. Now you're saved. Can you lose your salvation? Yes, you can. There are situations in which people can even lose their salvation. However, God is so wonderful. God is so good that He accepts you as His child. And you can go back to sin, turn your life around, abandon God. God still loves you. God still sees you as one of His children. Is He pleased with your ways? No, He's not. And God clearly says here to His children, we, I have two kinds of children. Those that are like shrubs in the desert and those that are like trees planted by the water. Jesus mentioned this truly. And He said, by the fruit you will know that they're my disciples. In order to have fruit, you need to be planted by the waters. But there are some Christians that are dry. They're like shrubs in the desert. They're under a curse. They didn't lose their salvation. They're still saved. They're Christian. But they have no fruit. They bear no fruit. That's not the will of God. God wants to bless us. Now let's try to understand this a little bit better. On verse 5, there are two different Hebrew words that are translated as man. Let me go back to verse 5. Verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now, blessed is the man, the first word man here. We have in English the word man, but in Hebrew there's two different words. It's the word Jeber. Or Jeber. And Jeber means a valiant man, a warrior, a person of position. It's not just any man, it's a strong man, it's a warrior. So the Lord say, cursed is the man, the warrior, that trusts in man. And then the second word used there, it's a different word, it's the word Adam. And Adam means just a low man, a low degree, a, a low individual. We know this is the word used for the first man. It's earth, it's nothing. So what the Lord is truly saying is, cursed is the man who trusts in man, but who trusts in an inferior kind of person. Now this is not very politically correct what I'm going to say. So in order to understand this, I would like to explain a little bit better 
Because what God is saying is, cursed is the man of value who puts his trust in someone who is inferior to himself. Now when I say inferior, I'm not trying to say that some people are low, some people are high, but let me try to explain this and I need three people to come here and to, to help me hold in some uh, paper, okay? So, uh, Pastor John, can you choose three people? <laughs> Go ahead. You don't need to say anything. All right. And, and then I'm going to ask some other people and you, you can help me bringing these people all together. All right. So, here we're going to have a mayor. The mayor of Greenfield Park. And here we have a police officer. And here we have a nurse. All right, can you hold the paper so we want to see who you are? All right, so let me give you an example so you'll understand what I'm talking about. What do I mean by superior and inferior? Imagine these three people are driving their cars on a highway. And there's an accident. They arrive to the scene of the accident and uh, there's a man there, here's the man. I'm not going to ask him to lay down on the floor. But imagine this is the, this is the man that suffered the accident. The car is completely shattered. The windows are broken. Okay, here we go. That, that's the car. It's a bad accident. And he's... Let's say he's sitting down inside the car and he's hurt. Now we have, remember, three people stopped over there. The mayor, the police officer, and the nurse. Now, as they arrive in the scene of the accident, everybody knows the mayor. Because he's known. His face has been in all over the place. The police officer is identified because you know we can see by the uniform it's a police officer and the nurse she's still dressing as a nurse you look like a nurse today <laughs> and they arrive to the scene of the accident my question is who who is superior in terms of acting who has the authority to act and to help that man that is inside that damaged car. Yes. What about the police officer? You say it's the police officer? Help me. This man is bleeding. This man is really bleeding. The arm is broken. The face is bleeding. He's unconscious. Who is the superior? Nurse. 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 Okay, nurse, can you go up here? <laughs> All right. So, one more, one more. Nurse. All right. So, can we agree on this? In this situation, the nurse is superior to the mayor and to the police officer. This is functional authority. It's not that as a person the nurse is superior to any of them, but in this particular situation the nurse is superior. Now, you can uh, just toss those papers, put it down, and don't go away yet, but I'm going to ask you, can you come here? Now, nurse, can you come down? Now you're not a police officer, now you're a dog. <laughs> All right. You go to the hospital because you feel that you have kind of a flu. Okay? And you come first to the nurse, right? Triage. How do you say that in English? <laughs> Triage. <laughs> See. So you come to the nurse, the nurse checks the pulse checks the temperature and the nurse tells you 
Well, I think you have a mild flu, but let's wait for the doctor. Now, you come to the doctor, and the doctor says, we need to run some tests, because I think you have something really bad. Who do you trust? The nurse or the doctor? <laughs> can we agree the doctor? Yes. Okay, doctor, can you go a little bit uh, higher? So, who, who is superior? The doctor. The doctor. I'm not talking about people. Listen, I'm talking about their function. All right? When you arrive, you need to make a choice between these two. Now, now you're going to be a judge. I'm going to ask you to come here up and pass the Jordan. Today you're a court worker. All right. You have some trouble with the law. And you have a friend, his name is Jordan Wood, <laughs> and he, he works for the court. And he really knows about this stuff, laws and things. And you come to him for advice. And he gives you some advice regarding your case. But in the meantime, someone introduces you to a judge. And this judge is actually the person in charge of that court. And they give you different opinions about your case. Who do you trust? Judge. The judge or the court worker? Judge. Judge? judge? Well, but you know the court worker for 15 years, I think. Judge. He's such a nice guy. Judge? judge? Okay. So the judge is superior. Can you come here? And let's put the court worker here. All right. Two more. I need two more people. I actually need four more people. Can you help me? Philippe, no. <laughs> After you walk. <laughs> can, can you come? Okay. Can you come here? Up here, yeah. And two more. Uh, this I'm, I'm going to wait a little bit and I'm going to give you the same. All right. Now you're in the army. Yeah. And sergeant <laughs> told you that you need to do something and you're working according to the orders of the sergeant. In the meantime, Captain Cecilia shows up <laughs> and Captain says, what are you doing here? Go and get this for me. Are you going to stay there and obey the sergeant or are you going to obey the captain? <laughs> who obeys the captain? Okay, so who's superior? <laughs> the captain. Can you go here? All right. So let me let me go here further. The captain. All right. Judge. Now I want you two guys to come here. Now. You're going to be the first lady deacon in our church. <laughs> and we have Pastor John here. Now this is church. Now you have some concern about the church. You're really worried. Because, I mean, this is your church. You've been here for 20 years. And you know the deacon for 15 years. And there's Pastor John that arrived two years ago, three years ago. Now this is so silent. Why are you <laughs> and you have this concern. Who should you talk to? Deacon. Pastor. Pastor. Okay. Okay. This is where some people fall under a curse. Because they can trust in authority in every area, but they don't trust in church. And let me tell you, in church, the authority is the pastor. Yes. And you might not like what I'm saying, but this is the reality. So, pastor, can you go over there? And some, now some people are really upset with me. But I have to tell you this. Why should people accept all these things in society? 
But in church, they don't accept that the pastor is in authority. I wanted to show you just this. And uh, I want to thank you. Let's give a hand of applause for that. And um, I still have two more. So I'm, I'm going to ask Pastor Jordan to stay here. And you can sit here. All right. Now your name is Culture, and your name is Bible. Culture tells you a lot of things. Culture, for instance, tells you that um, man exists by accident. That we were not created. There was a cosmic accident. And so, through the evolution, culture and school will tell you something. But the Bible tells you a different one. Now, who is superior? The Bible or culture? Bible. Well, we're in church, so I know, I know you're going to answer this. But what do you answer deep in your heart? Now, society tells you, and many churches now, that it's okay now to bring gay marriage into church. That's culture. So some ch certain churches are looking at the Bible and they're trying to kind of adapt to the culture. Now, if a person is a gay person and a Christian, and you tell me you cannot be gay and Christian. Yes, you can. And now you're shocked with the pastor. Because not only he blasted your belief that the deacon is superior to the pastor. <laughs> but now you're upset because I'm telling you that you can be a gay and a Christian. Yes, you can. You can be a gay and a Christian. What's the bigger sin? Is it to kill someone or is it to be a gay? Can God forgive a murderer? Yes. Why can't God forgive a gay person? Certain people, they accept the Lord and they continue in their own ways. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convince them of their sin. Now it's not the work of the church to twist the Bible in order to bless something that God cursed. So I hope you understand. Of course, we accept that someone can be a gay and a Christian. I do. Maybe you don't, but I do. Now culture wants me to bless their unions. But the Bible clearly says that I cannot bless something that is cursed. Are you following me? Yes. So who should, shall I choose first? Can we go up to two steps? I need to put the Bible first. Who do I trust? Culture? Or the Bible? Okay, thank you. Let's give a hand for, for them. I hope this is clear to you. And I'm going to bring back the verse that we're meditating on. Where it says, Cursed is the man, Jabber, valiant man, that trusts in man, someone inferior. And let me tell you that when you make your choices, it's a choice of wisdom, you know, in order to choose the judge over the court worker, in order to choose this person over that person, because there's different positions. And let me tell you, I've been pastoring this church for three years now, and some people here need to break free from a curse of narrow vision. Because whenever you have a problem, a spiritual problem, you should approach the pastors, not the deacons. And I'm saying this with all respect I have for the deacons. They're here also to help you. Yes, they are. But if you refuse to talk to the pastors, and you go to the deacons, you know what you're doing? You're lowering the level of what God can do in your own life. It's not because the pastor is superior to the deacon as a person, 
But in terms of authority, the Bible states and the constitution of our church that the pastor is the authority. So you go to the authority. Why should you, you know, go for something or someone that is lower? Or as some people say, you know what, I don't trust pastors. If you don't trust the pastor, you better move to another church where you trust the pastor. Or if that pastor is not trustworthy, he better move himself. And by the way, it's the second time I tell in this church that you better move to another church if you're in this situation. It's the second time. So please don't misquote me. And all our, our services are on the internet. But I need to teach you this. Because certain Christians are under a curse. They don't know why. And you know why? It's because they lower their level of trust. The Lord is not telling you you cannot trust people. The Lord says you are cursed when you trust below what you should. And it says blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And now notice the difference. The difference is fruitfulness. So my question is what do you see around you? What do you see? I once had a person coming to me with a pile of complaints about our church. And I didn't want to listen. And you know why? Because what I see is different. I see a vibrant church. I see a youth group that is vibrant. I come here, I see that those kids, uh, 50, 60 kids, they stay here till 11. I come here to the prayer meetings that, by the way, this week they're going to happen on Tuesday, on Thursday, and on Friday. And Friday at 7 p.m. So last week I came to church. I see people praying everywhere. You know, I, I come to church and I see kids in the park. And I see all the kids, you know, enjoying themselves and receiving great blessings from the Lord. I come to share and I see about 100 people coming to our church to receive help. During the week we have al groups. We have AA groups. We have uh, uh, AA for women, AA for men. We have all sorts of people coming to church. I see people coming to me and saying how blessed they are. Some come to me with testimonies of healing, of blessing. This is what I see. Now, if you see just bad things, where are you? You see, if you're in the desert, you see shrubs. If, if you're by the water, you see fruitfulness. Depends on where you are. It doesn't depend truly on your personal experience, but it really depends on your fruitfulness. Are you being fruitful? What is the fruit of your lips? What are you doing for the Lord? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 17, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. What is your fruit? Good fruit? If you have good fruit, imagine what happens. People want to be with you. People want to be in the church where you are. People want to listen to what you have to say. People want to come with you. People will, will see the fruit in your life. But if you have diseased fruit, something is wrong. And, the, and Jesus said, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree uh, bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he said, thus you recognize them by their fruits. What is your fruit? Is your fruit just bad stuff? You just see bad stuff around you? Are you always complaining? Where are you? Where is your placement geographically? Are you by the waters? Because if you're by the waters, you just see good fruit around you. If you just see bad things, let me tell you, you're in the desert. Let this be the symptom to show you if you're under a blessing or under a curse. You know, people that are around me are blessed people. I'm so glad, you know, I come here, I, I, used, I have a break on Mondays, then on Tuesday I'm here, I'm with the pastors. And we talk about the weekend. And guess what? We talk about all the good things that happen. And we talk about certain things that were not as good, and we talk about how we're going to improve this. Okay, this didn't work that well. How are we going to change this? And we pray and we're together. 
And then we continue with our life. And we win souls. And we bring people. And we advise people. And listen, we're so worried in giving, bearing good fruit that sometimes we don't see what's out there in the wilderness. Because if I'm planted by the waters, what I see around me is fruitfulness. What do you see? What do you see? That's the great question that I have for you. John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. What is your fruit? How many people are here in the church that can say we're blessed by you? By your words? How many people have you brought to this church and that they're now saved? How many people outside in the street, you know, come to you and say, oh, how are you? You know, pray for me. Does that happen at all? Think about the fruit. Because the fruit is really, really, really what matters in your spiritual life. If you're dry, let me tell you, it's time to put your trust in the Lord. Don't put your trust in man. Don't put your trust in things that are below. Who do you trust? What is your level of fruitfulness? Are you seeing God's blessing around you? If you just see bad things happening around you, let me tell you, you're not planted by the waters. You're a shrub in the desert. Both the shrub and the tree are alive. With one difference. One bears fruit, the other one barely survives. What is your level in the spirit? Are you just surviving? Let me tell you the same passage that we read. It says a little bit further down. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately seek. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So here's the Lord putting us to the test. And what's the test? The test is your fruitfulness. The test is what you do. If you're busy just saying bad things about church and about pastors and about everything around you, if your level of being busy is just criticizing and murmuring, you're still saved. I have good news for you. You're saved. God is so good. He loves you. He says, you're my child. You're still saved. You didn't, you're not losing your salvation. But the Lord is testing your heart, your deeds. And He's telling you, be careful. Because your heart can deceive you. You can think that it's one thing and it's another. So let me test your deeds. Let me test what you're doing. What are you doing with your spare time? Sometimes we have people coming here begging you, saying, man, please come to the man meeting. Just <laughs> dizzy you with me. We have people coming here and saying, please come to our kids in the park mandolin concert. It was awesome. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I was sitting here. They were playing almost just for me. <laughs> and, and for Don and for a few people that were here. And, uh, and we, we try to encourage people, you know, come to church, bear good fruit, bring others, you know, talk about salvation, do these things. Why? Because we want to see God's blessing in your life. Because God says, blessed is he who trusts in me. So it's time to get the shrub and put the shrub by the waters. And when you put the shrub by the waters, there's roots. And when you're rooted by the waters, Nobody can move you out of that place. Are you moving by the waters? Look around you and tell me, what do you see? So many times in the Bible the Lord does this question. Ezekiel, what do you see? Jesus asked the disciples, what do you see in me? What do people say about me? Now what do you see in me? What, what, what was the answer? Well, people say that you were you're Elijah. Some people say that you're one of the prophets. Yeah, but what do you see in me? You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. That's who you are. How do they know this? Because they were close to Jesus. They were close to Him. There's something that I call the Judas Syndrome. You know what's the Judas Syndrome? 
It's like this. Judas had a pastor. His name was Jesus. But because he didn't like the things that Jesus was saying and doing, because he had the purse and he wanted to control the finances of, of the group, he decided to go to the Sinedrion. It's another authority. I mean, if he's a rabbi, let's go to the superintendent and sell the guy. Hello? That's the Judas syndrome. It's when you don't accept the authority that you have and you go to another authority to betray the authority that God gave you. Are you following me? Yes. This happens in the family. That's why we have such a high rate of divorce. This happens everywhere. Question is, how's your spiritual life? James said in James 2.14, What good is it, my brothers, if, one, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? So also, faith by itself, if it not, does not have works, is dead. So you can say you have all the faith in the world. But if your faith doesn't bear fruit, if there's nothing practical that you're doing, you're not helping with, with the ministry to the poor. You're not helping with Sunday school. You're not helping ushering people. You're not helping with anything. Your help is just to discourage others. Does that save you? Of course not. Of course not. So my message today is about fruitfulness. And about who do you trust? It's not about not trusting people. But you need to really to trust the Lord. And let me tell you, if you just see desert around you, that's a matter of trust. So stop trusting in people and start trusting the Lord. Stop putting your trust in things that are below and start putting your trust in the right order, in the right priority of things, in the right ranking. Because otherwise, there's barrenness in your life, there's all sorts of curses, there's diseases, there's even some people that don't discern the body of Christ and they die ahead of time. What about that? I don't want that to happen to any of you. So then let me tell you a final note on gratitude. If you don't recognize the blessing, you'll not be able to be grateful to the Lord. Now, I'm not going back to Jeremiah 17.5, or do I have a verse here? I don't have it here. But the curse that is mentioned there on Jeremiah 17.5, cursed is the man who trusts on men. The curse is that you don't see God's blessings. They're there, but you cannot see them. The blessing is there, but you cannot see the blessing. If you don't see the blessing, how can you be grateful? You know, certain men are always complaining about their wives. And when they lose their wives, what the wife goes, then he starts thinking, Oh my God, now I need to wash my socks. How am I going to do this? Are you following me? They cannot see the blessing they have in having a wife to wash the socks. <laughs> and more. But what I want to tell you today, if you cannot see the blessings, you're not grateful. You're not grateful. It's like those kids, you give them everything. You give them the last Nintendo, the last uh, Xbox, the last thing, the last iPod and iPad and all things. And everything is tossed around. They don't care the less. They're not grateful because they have everything. Certain Christians are spoiled as little brats because they're under a curse and they cannot see the blessing. They have nothing to be grateful. Try to live with a frustrated man or a frustrated woman and soon you'll start thinking about leaving. Hello? If you arrive home and ladies, you just nag your husband and you mistreat your husband and you just say bad things about your husband, gets to a point, he starts thinking, how did I get into this situation? I need to opt out. I need out of this. Are you following me? Now the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you this very gently, but the Holy Spirit 
can also plan to live the life of a Christian that keeps complaining, bears no fruit, and is good for nothing but to be burned. So let me tell you, God searches your heart. God will give you according to your deeds. Faith without works is dead. If there's no fruitfulness, if there's nothing to be grateful, you just have a big complaint to do about everything about the world, and you can't wait to arrive close to God and say, God, how come I suffered so much? I have news for you. You will never ask that question to the Lord because He will never allow that to happen. The Lord will allow only a grateful heart, a good attitude, fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is the most important thing. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of evil treasure produces evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. What do you speak? What is your speech? Do you speak good things? Are you grateful? Are you honestly grateful for what you have? Even in the midst of disease, of problems, of all sorts of issues that are going on in your life, can you be grateful to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm thankful to you? Amen. Can you be grateful when you're in a wheelchair? Can you be grateful when you're blind? Can you be grateful? You know, when there's no fruit around you, I love the words of Habakkuk that said, even if there's no fruitfulness around me, I'll be fruitful. Even if the fig tree doesn't produce, yes. even if the, if the fruit is not coming, it, it's lying, it's in that there's fruit, there's no fruit, I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. Can you have that same kind of attitude in your heart? Now, what you speak shows the abundance of your heart. If you just complain about how tired you are, is that a good confession? Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Is that a good confession? Oh, I have this pain, and I have this pain, and I have this pain. If this is what comes out of your mouth, what can the Lord do with your confession? What glory does that bring to the Lord? But if you say, I'm tired, but the Lord is my strength. In Him, I am strong. Yes, you know, you know what, I'm so tired and I'm here and it's so hot, I want to go home, but I know I need to listen to this. Just poke the person next to you and tell the person, you had to listen to this message. <laughs> Praise God. And I, I want to tell you just this, and, and, and in, in much love, in much love, listen, when we love people, when I love someone, I warn them if they're going on the wrong way. I want the best for my kids. I want the best for my church. My role here, it's not to come here and to beat up the congregation. I don't do that. But my role here is to tell you, if you just see barrenness around you, it's time to stop trusting in people and put your trust in the Lord. Amen. It's time today to tell, game over. I'm done. I don't want to see more barrenness around me. I want to be fruitful. Yes. And when you say to the Lord, Lord, I trust in you from all my heart. Change me. Forgive me. Guess what happens? He uh, it brings you out of the wilderness, that shrub in the desert, with no roots. You know the shrub in the desert has no roots? Well, th there's roots, but the roots th don't, don't pick up to the ground. They're, uh, they're just in the air. It rotates. It's tossed around. Just desert. But the Lord wants to plant you by the waters and everything you do will be fruitful i mean everything and when you see fruitfulness then you start thanking the lord and you say lord i'm so grateful thank you for my wife thank you for my church thank you for my pastor thank you lord thank you for the health you gave me thank you god thank you for the job that that, that i have or the one that i'm going to get thank you lord you you start thanking the lord for what you have and for you're about to have are you following me do you want to be fruitful? Let us all stand. And, and let's give a hand of applause to the Lord. Praise God. So, the question is, who do you trust? Remember, cursed 
is the man or the woman who trusts in something that's inferior. It's like saying, I trust God, but I'm having some problems, some issues with my wife, so I'm going to this psychiatrist. He's really good. You know, my, my neighbor told me how good he is. What about coming to church and talk to your pastor before you go to the psychiatrist? You know what you're doing? You're falling under a curse. Because instead of trusting Geber, someone at the same level, you're trusting in someone that is at an inferior level. What about that issue that you have and you feel sick for a number of years and you go from doctor to doctor, from doctor to doctor. And whenever we have an altar call at the church, you say, well, I don't want to go there. Benny Hinn already prayed for me. Nothing, ha nothing happened. What about coming to the pastor and say, you know, pastor, can you come to my house, anoint me with oil? I, I, I need to receive prayer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if you don't do this, then you fall into curse and you don't know it. Because people, Christians that are under a curse, unfortunately, are the majority of, of Christians that, that we see around in churches. Even when the Lord comes, only half of the church, half of the virgins will have oil. The other half will be in darkness. And this is not, nothing you know, to boast about. But the question is, do you have oil? Are you producing fruit? Are you grateful? Is there something that you can tell the Lord, Lord, I'm so grateful for this? Or is it just negative things? bad things, complaints, you know, everything around you is bad and you hate it and you hate the world and you hate people and you hate church and you hate Christians and you hate everybody. You don't say it, but you demonstrate with your words and your actions. 